welcome to the Remarkable Relationship Show with Mercy Russell, where we find the wonder in your story. I will be your host for the next hour. I have over 35 years of experience applying the science of relationship systems to my practice of psychotherapy and leadership consulting. My intuitive skills allow me to bring clarity and vision to your challenges. I hope you will be surprised in the next hour. Good morning. This is Mercy Russell with the Remarkable Relationship Show. My goal is to bring a fresh perspective to you on all things related to how humans develop their individual brilliance while navigating the excitement, stickiness, and resistance in their relationships. In my 40 years of working as a psychotherapist and consultant, I have been continually amazed at the ways in which people overcome challenges. I hope to share my experience and insights so that you can find the magic in your relationships. So my, my hope in this show is to answer questions and challenges you are facing in your relationships. There are several ways you can ask me a question. You can send me a question by email at mercy at leadershipwithmercy.com. This gives you anonymity since I will not share the identity of the listener asking the question. I often disguise the identity of the listener by changing details while addressing the problematic dynamic. My answers will be available during the live show as well as on the KKNW podcast and the KKNW YouTube channel. In addition, I post transcripts of the shows on my website, leadershipwithmercy.com. Please don't be shy about asking questions. I recognize that it can take courage to call into a radio show when we're having the call in open mic, especially about personal matters. I have rarely heard a unique dilemma. Your question will help other people listening to the show. Plus, this allows me to know what interests you. I am interested in all corners of human behavior and relationships, so I need your help to know how I can address what troubles and intrigues you. Eventually, I hope to have listeners call into the show. I am excellent on the spot, knowledgeable and intuitive. As a listener, I get so much more from a conversation between a host and a caller. So, today my guest is John Miller. John is a documentary photographer based in Irisburg, Vermont. His career has spanned a wide range of projects on life in northeastern Vermont, what we call the Northeast Kingdom, Italy, the West, well, anywhere he travels. Today we will be talking about the evolution of his career as an artist and his deep love for humanity. Welcome, John. Thank you. So just before we get started, I just want to say um, uh, John Miller and I are personal friends. We've known each other for, uh, gee, I don't even know how many years it is now. It feels like 20. I think it's 20, over 20 years, 25 years, I think, close to 25 years. And um, what, what, part of what we're going to be talking today about is John's John's life and upbringing in this northeastern corner of Vermont, um, where I also grew up. And there are several themes, you know, between his life and mine that are very, uh, at least intriguing um, to me. Um, John's partner is my best friend from fourth grade. And so we've gotten to know each other on many different levels. But I really want to have a chance to share with you today his experience and and his perspective as an artist and also as a as a member of a deep community. Welcome, John. Thank you, Lucy, very much. It's wonderful to speak with you this morning. Um, so, John, let's just jump right in. And um, so I guess where I really like to start is by talking about how your early experiences and challenges in childhood had an influence on how your career and your development, your develop, discovery and development of yourself as an artist occurred. Um, so you grew, you were born, where were you, you were born in Coventry, is that correct? Well, I was born in a 
a nearby town in the hospital, uh -huh. but grew yeah. up in a, an old house in Northern Vermont, which my parents had uh, purchased right after World War II. They were both urban people uh, who were sort of early homesteaders and, and any number of people. I mean, one, there have been different waves of people who migrated away from the cities into rural parts of America. And my parents, in 1946, purchased this house in Northern Vermont, paid no. way, too, way, way too much for it. They paid $3,500 for the house <laughs> in 1946. Yeah, um, my family came because my grandparents summered in Vermont and bought a house in the 30s. But wasn't that part of the nearing, the Scott nearing uh, yeah. era? That's exactly right, Scott Nearing era. And I think they also came into Vermont at about that period. Right, so they so there was a movement about that time of people moving from urban areas into these very rural areas and, and buying old houses. Well, I didn't quite know that part. Um, so what was it, so you, and how many, just to tell people how, how large Coventry is. Coventry, um, I was, you know, grew up in the, the village of Coventry, which may have, might have had, oh, maybe 30 houses, right. a couple of churches, a general store, very small. And, and the, the, the whole town of Coventry might have had maybe a thousand people, uh -huh. many, many of whom were involved with agriculture, farming. Mm -hmm. And did you, you went to the school, the, the public school in the town, right? Correct? Right. I, high school? My, my first few years uh, was in a classroom which had the first five grades, grade one through five. And then uh, the other side of this building had grades uh, six, seven, and eight. That was, it was essentially yeah. that was an experience having five grades. And the poor teacher had, one single teacher had to, uh, do you know teach the five grades and we would be sitting idle while other grades were being taught it was a very curious way with which to teach but it was I'm sure a great challenge for the teachers right and you had um you had a particular experience with reading correct Re reading penmanship I was somehow <laughs> fated to become left-handed and, and it's okay but um I know for the first few years when we were uh, doing our cursive uh, you know, penmanship assignments, I had uh, I was not allowed to use my left hand. I had to uh, do all of these exercises with my right hand because it was somewhat taboo to use your left hand. Yeah, that's a that uh, that's a really interesting topic we could talk about quite a bit because I think it really influences you know, well, how the brain developments, you know, for better or for worse. And, and, the, and the second part of the this challenge for me was I always, um, in terms of um, verbal memory, I was always had great difficulty, um, you know, at part of every um, grade and, and certainly elementary school on into high school, one had to memorize things. And I always had great troubles remembering uh, words and things. And um, I just assumed it was had nothing to do with a, any kind of uh, disability per se. It just other students seem to be very easily memorizing things, and, and, and uh, I could I had great difficulties doing it. So this would be memorizing things, um, well, like uh, poems, short poems and things, or you know, right. music for class plays and things and performances. It was always somewhat challenging. Yeah, sort of an auditory memory, being able Aud to auditory, remember. auditory, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, oh, you, you you told a story about your parents, um, <laughs> how they tried to help you, right? Well, they, well, one of the, was yes, and it was it was it was done very seriously. But one of my Christmas presents, as a very young child, it might have been I might have been oh maybe six or seven or eight, I was given a book. I think it might have been quite popular with people who had some form of reading and comprehension challenges. It, the book was called Why Johnny Can't Read. So that was given to me for a Christmas present. Um, I was in, I in no way felt threatened by this, but I guess <laughs> in my older age being somewhat cynical now, it was, it was a rather <laughs> mean-spirited thing to do. But anyway, it, it, 
I, I read it very carefully and, and uh, I don't know if it did much good in terms of my, my verbal <laughs> prowess. Right. I've, when you've told me the story, I've always wished your mother, now I'm sure your mother knows this and knew it long before she, you know, died, but I'd love for her to see your, your library today, <laughs> you know, the number of books in your house. And right. whenever well, I, you know, go over at the holidays, I'm always curious, you know, what new books you're bringing in, you know, for your, you know, both you and Jeannie. So, yeah, it's a, sort of a, 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 it's an irony, isn't it? That. Well, I, for some reason, I didn't retain that book. I did keep some of my children's books, which were late. Sometimes I was given books that had sort of a, a, a rather wild and crazy edge to them. Like, the, the, you actually uh, have a separate building with books. Well, it's, 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 it's a small sort of an archive of my work and my book collection. Yes. Right, right, right. On your property. Um, so the other thing that we've talked about is I just wanted to touch on to it a little bit more. I guess we'll, we'll talk about it more, but just really, you know, this is a small town in rural Vermont and you, your friends, your parents were from the city, but your friends were from, you know, from very different backgrounds. Can you just explain to us what that was like? Well, it's actually growing up as a child in a, in a small village in northern Vermont. I, I look back at it very positively. It was a wonderful experience. We, um, we it was a large group of friends who always hung together, uh, male and female kids. And um, in the winter, when it was twenty or thirty below zero, or if it was in the summer when it was a <laughs> hundred degrees warmer than that uh, or more much more actually. Um, we were always outside playing if it was, wasn't was sliding and tobogganing and, and uh, just playing in the snow, it was it was fishing. And when we, I grew up next to a river, the Black River in Northern Vermont, and we were always fishing and, um, or swimming in the river. And, um, or as we grew older, some of us were given, you know, BB guns were 22s. We went hunting in our own right. small way, but we were always very much embracing the outdoors. I mean, my mother, even in the winter, as cold as it was, she'd say, we'd ask her what to do. She said, go outside. We were just sent out for the day and, right. and we'd come right. back at lunch, maybe freezing cold, but, but, but it was not a, a bad thing. You were in no way being admonished. We just loved doing things. We were always able right. to come up with some form of activity that which we enjoyed, as simple as it might have been. But also, your friends and your classmates came from very different types of families than you. Yeah, I mean, I grew up with kids. I mean, they, we had a garage in town, and some of my friends uh, grew up upstairs over the garage. Um, other kids' parents ran a little general store. Uh, at some point, I think in the later 1950s, um, late 1950s, they began to merge the schools because each many of the towns, small towns, even ours, had each town a uh, school in the village, but we also had two to three small uh, neighborhood schools, elementary schools um, for students out in one in the northwestern part of town would go to a small school. Others in the western part of town or the southern part of town went to a different one. Uh, and then they, at some point they merged all the schools. And that, uh, what happened is the kids who came in from the outlying areas, uh, a very large percentage of them were uh, French families, uh, who all of whom were uh, parents were farmers. So it was a very interesting change because you know, remember we were village kids. Um, and although some parents worked right in town, um, no, actually, one family was agricultural, um, but it was the merging of the schools in the late 1950s that brought in large numbers of French families, which is interesting. It was a big transition, um, uh -huh. and it was, uh, but it, it, it really, it was in no way um, uncomfortable. I mean, it was just made just more friends, and it was it was fun. Right. Um, so you you grew up in this sort of rich, diverse you know, intimate community. And then in high school, you went away to school. 
I, yes, I was, uh, I went away to a private school uh, next door in New Hampshire. And um, that was, it was, it was a more complicated challenge, certainly um, arriving. I always say it, I left uh, Northern Vermont reading the Hardy Boys. And when I arrived at the school in New Hampshire, beginning my freshman year in high school, many of the students uh, had already finished reading Catcher in the Rye or something, right? So I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was quite a contrast between the level of education which I had had in elementary school and the, many of the students who came in. Any number of them were actually international students coming in from Italy and other parts of the world. And, right. Um, so and there was a huge, a very different social very different social, economic class, everything. Very, very, very different. Um, which at times it became glaringly different. Um, but in general, it's, you know, I think certainly the the administrators and the faculty understood right off the bat that this was a a more diverse group of students and the um they created many avenues with which we could um, find enjoyable ways with which to interact and immediately embrace relationships and friendships with one another. I mean, I think sports, for instance, is a very, uh, academics, one thing, but the sports, I think were a major part of, uh, bringing mm -hmm. people together to work collaboratively, um, and in association in, in positive ways. So I right. think they, they, they could right. defuse, um, many issues that could have otherwise arisen, I think, with such a diverse audience. Right. So that's what a rich experience for developing community life in a very different way. Um, I guess one of the themes that we've talked about in terms of your career and your work has also been the contrast between, um, you know, privilege, people of privilege and those who are, you know, really living in what we would call poverty, you know, or what, 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 what economists would call poverty. And so this, I often think of your early experience as, you know, giving you a person, giving you insight into those differences coming from this very intimate, heartfelt relationship with, you know, people who are, who others might consider living in poverty and then going into being, you, you can see the privilege because it wasn't natural to your community. So you, that, that contrast and perspective, I think was always, highlighted for you in these experiences that's, that's right i mean it was it was um i mean my parents had had a more privilege certainly and and uh, although they their, their families had gone through the depression and had you know had had great challenges during that period whereas i think as i said in northern vermont nobody knew there was a depression because nothing really changed in terms of <laughs> income right so i, mean, I think that that, that my uh -huh. parents certainly um, had experienced that. Um, and I think, you know, again, many of the, the kids with whom I um, grew up, it was many of them, we, we didn't use words like poor or poverty. Those are sort of 1960s kinds of it, terms, I think, that were coming out with many of the social programs. But it's, um, you, you just knew that when I would go over and have, meals at my friends' houses, you know, they, some of them, they had very, very little food for large, in their, with their large families, mm -hmm. or others had lots of wild meat, for instance, because their, their, their parents were big hunters. So it was, it was a wonderful experience, actually, for me. It, was, it wasn't all in any way uh, monochrome in terms of the, the very colorful mm -hmm. kinds right. of diets that people had in, in, in this northern rural yeah. area. Yeah, it's interesting you say that about the not having the word poor because, well, in Saint, I grew up in St. Johnsbury, which is a town in the North, as Northeast Kingdom that has the, you know, the uh, moniker, the capital of the Northeast Kingdom. It was this, it's a town of 10,000 people, <laughs> but, or almost 9,000 9, something. But there was, I think we did have the word poor, but I don't remember using it among, you know, my friends. But um, there was a poor farm, right? So there was, but that was before social welfare, right? That there was sort of a community response to trying to help people who needed help and in the best of the, in the, best of the situation. 
So John, I want to move on. We can obviously talk for the whole hour about this, but I just, you know, I want to just move on to your discovery of photography. Okay, and tell us a little bit about how you discovered photography as um, a passion. I was at, uh, after graduating from um, high school, I went on to University of Vermont um, and majored in geology. I had been influenced by a, a fellow uh, son of a, a woman who my father was dating after my parents' divorce in the 1950s. My father moved west to California and I'd visit him in the, in the summers and he happened to uh, have a close friend whose son uh, was a geology major at the University of California in Santa Barbara. And, and he took me under his wing, again, as a mentor, taught me how to play tennis. He was a very great tennis player. Mm -hmm. um, and also as being a geology major, he'd take me out at night down to the oil rigs where he was had to work uh, was sort of an apprenticeship working on these oil rigs um, in the Santa Barbara area. And I'll never forget climbing way up in these oil rigs late at night and all these big, tough looking men, they, of course they call them roughnecks who work in these things, doing the drilling and operations around these oil derricks. Uh, I just never forget these guys, these, these huge fellows uh, cover the oil and things. And uh, you've seen the book by Richard Avedon, American West, we, mm -hmm. it was certainly for me, it was a reminder of what I had seen is when I was, uh, the, um, and actually I, I'll tell you about that again, it was, I was probably a, maybe a sophomore in high school when I had that experience, but it very much influenced me and my interest in geology. So I, I, I majored in geology at UVM. And then in terms of your question, Terms of the influence of photography, it wasn't until about my junior or senior year, uh, one of my friends at the university had discovered photography and using the darkroom. And he, we were, became good, pretty good friends. And he encouraged me to try out, um, you know, getting a more serious camera using film and um, doing some processing, which I did in our little bathroom in our little apartment, mm -hmm. which we had at that point. Um, and that was, that, was a, that was an amazing experience, first working in a dark room and seeing that print develop and the image develop in that tray in the darkness. Um, and by the time I graduated, I found that the geology discipline was really interesting. I loved the mapping and being in the outdoors, but the complexity of of the some of the courses, advanced calculus and uh, other advanced science courses, advanced um, many science courses, it was just too much for me to fathom. You remember that I'm the person who <laughs> still had verbal memory challenges, but oh. so here I'm dealing with these wild equations and every other thing. Um, it seemed that photography was a a very wonderful reprieve from some of this just this intense uh, work in the sciences. And so I, by the time I graduated, I realized that I wanted to be a photographer. I wasn't quite sure how that would play out, but um, I did that. And one of the pivotal experiences, as I think it was my senior year, actually one of the things I had to do is I didn't have quite enough credits to graduate uh, in 1970 when I was supposed to. I, I also became 1A. Uh, in terms of mm. military service, and it so happened that the time. I want to explain what that means, to you know, because yeah, quite a few of our listeners, are, you know, well, weren't, weren't storm for any number of people like myself who, uh, when we were turning twenty-one, we all um, had to have, um, you know, we had to be considered for military service, and they also had the draft. So I uh, remember sitting in the basement of my members of the fraternity and we went out and bought a couple of kegs of beer and turned on the television and we all drank beer and watched them sort of twirl this thing and they'd pull out these numbers and and, and some of the craziest party people in my fraternity, it, which was sort of somewhat like the movie Animal House, uh, screeched and laughed as they got about the highest numbers, whereas I got a middle number and and uh, was I had not quite graduated with my geology degree and um, was also married 
at a young age. Actually, I'd just gotten married. And I became, By the time well, you graduated from UVM? The time I was, yeah, I was married. Yeah. And, and UVM is the University of Vermont for our listeners. But, but, yes. Vermont. And, <laughs> but, but I think one of the, uh, I became eligible and, and was, you know, received 1A. And uh, in the geology department, a few of the fellows also had, um, who, and we, at that point, um, I was still very involved with finishing school. I was married and I didn't, had, and I think we were going to be, I think we had not yet had a child quite yet, but uh, we soon were to have a daughter. And I joined a um, National Guard unit in, near Burlington um, to at least, uh, one, you know, it was fine to serve. I, if I many friends I admit, went head straight over the border into Canada. Others became Quakers overnight. And mm -hmm. but I, I went ahead and, and, and joined the military and uh, in the army and, and trained in engineering. Um, so that, but in that whole process, um, I had also, as I was about to graduate, decided I had to pursue one first step toward pursuing a career was to somehow learn more about photography. So I, um, I contacted a fellow named Minor White, who was then the sort of the senior, senior professor, very renowned photographer uh, at MIT in Cambridge, and uh, asked him if I could bring my portfolio and, and talk with him about uh, where I might pursue more education in photography. This geology has sort of been backburnered at that point. So I, I went um, down to Cambridge. I remember spring vacation at UVM and, and he spent about an hour with me just going through my portfolio and being very, very supportive. Uh, my portfolio is rather <laughs> meager in terms of the way it was presented. It wasn't a nicely matted print in a portfolio case, but I think he got a sense that, uh, that my intentions were sound and, and um, he seemed to see some promise in, in the, the kinds of imagery I was making, most of which were landscape and some architectural views. And uh, he suggested a couple of people with whom I might study. And, and I think what was interesting, he said, I don't think you should change the nature of what you're photographing and uh, particularly, but I think you need more work in terms of your technical development. So he mentioned two people, one Paul Caponegro, a very well-known photographer who taught workshops over in New York um, State, Northern New York State, and another fellow in Massachusetts uh, who I eventually connected with and that fall went and lived with him for eight weeks and studied the zone system technique with him. And this, this fellow, Stephen Gersh, uh, had worked with Ansel Adams for a number of years out in Carmel and been one of his master printers. As we know, we think of Ansel Adams and his wonderful photographs. He he didn't do it all by himself. He had quite a, an entourage of workers who would come through and, and as he was certainly their mentors, but he also sort of trained them and preened them to be his custom printers um, for many, his demands for printing were far beyond what a single person could possibly produce. So this fellow with whom I worked was just extraordinary black and white printer uh, and knew the zone system, of course, just intuitively. So. That, that, that was a, a very important experience working with him. And so, then, yeah. okay, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, so one of the things you've talked about quite a bit is the role of mentors, not only during your childhood, obviously, but because we, we'll, we can maybe touch on that again too, but also in the development of your career. Um, so, I might add, may I interrupt this for a second? I, it's just as we're speaking here, I, I'm realizing my focusing on the, the importance of mentoring. And I think of, about the fact that I had a very specific need in terms of mentoring. Uh, I think it was triggered in part because of a parental divorce when I was quite young at, at 10, 10 years of age. Uh, my father basically headed west and lived in California across the United States. I'd see him some on sometimes in the summers, but um, there was no real paternal influence for me um, for many, many, I think, crucial years. And I, 
I think that my continually seeking out mentors um, and it has continued in my work. And it was, it, mm-hmm. fortunately, maybe the thing, one of the things that really triggered that was be, be the loss of my father in, at, a, at a young age, but not to death, but almost like a death in a way, um, because it was just very little communication. And as not only was there our, the geographical distance between us, but mm-hmm. also his use of mind altering substance also um, was um, another wall that sort of kept us somewhat set, separated as it were right. for, for, for better communication. Um, and so the, as I back it up very quickly is that I first had mentors when I came out of in high school, a few was our, my, my coaches in athletics to um, my first job after, after high school was working one summer with the Vermont highway department where we had to, with hand size, mow grass along the sides of the road. We had this wonderful fellow, this older fellow, who was our mentor. And he showed us how to sharpen these side blades. And he he liked me so much that he gave me his side. He had two of them. And they were much better steel blades, very fine, almost paper-thin blades. And I'll never forget. Uh, we, and what was great about him is uh, he was from Irisburg. And he lived around the corner from where we now live, right? Uh-huh. So I thought that. How interesting that here we are, you know, 50 to 60 years later in, in the town right. where my one of my early mentors lived. But uh, and I later went back and thought, did a portrait of him, too. But um, the mentoring right up through and in, in running a, a business as a photographer, I work with so many extraordinary people. Um, right. And but it but it often required my going out and knocking on doors, it didn't come to me. It, I had to go out and seek mm-hmm. these people. And that, they made, that made all the difference because, uh, and, I, and I also, and I think maybe later on. Oh, John, I'm just yeah. gonna stop you here. We need to take a break, okay. but I okay. think that's a great note to leave on because I wanna hear you more about it. So in terms, cause I think it's so critical now in terms of social, social networking, it's the big theme, you know, wellness to the New York Times and social connection and the fact that you you don't just sit passively and wait for people to come to you. So anyway, this is Mercy Russell with the Remarkable Relationship Show. My guest today is John Miller, a documentary photographer from Northeastern Vermont, and we'll be back after the break. It's time that you are heard, and I don't mean in just a conversation. I mean really heard. Imagine hosting your very own radio program on Alternative Talk 1150. Talk about being heard. Call 425-653-1150 right now to learn how affordable it can be to host your own radio show. Time slots are going fast, so take hold of this chance by dialing 425-653-1150. Alternative Talk, we have an opportunity waiting just for you. Wherever you go, Alternative Talk 1150 is here for you. Hello, this is Bruce Russell with the Remarkable Relationship Show, and I'm here today with John Miller, a documentary photographer from Irisburg, Vermont. And we were just talking about his experience with mentors. And um, I think as you, as we, you know, before the break, we were, you, you were, you had just started to talk about the importance of the fact that you reached out to the people who became your mentors. I did. And um, I was just talking about a person in Northern Vermont who I had certainly just enjoyed immensely. Just a wonderful person, kind, spirited person, always playing jokes. But everything was done in, 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 uh, with kindness uh, as the basis behind whatever he did as in his mentoring. Um, and even in college, I, I, I honed in on the uh, chair of the geology department who really took me under his wing also, very kind person. Um, and I wasn't necessarily 
the top student in the class by any means. I, but I just kept plugging away at it, and I think he understood it. That uh, he just that um, I liked him, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And he went so far. I remember taking me to a big conference down at Yale University with some of the graduate students. And I was amazed that he just picked me out of the undergraduate class. And but he, mm -hmm. but it was a great experience. This traveling with these uh, geologists, all of whom were published geologists and you know, inventing different kinds of things. And, and so it was those kinds of mentor, mentoring uh, ships, but also uh, landing my first job. After it, it, as I was talking earlier about the uh, studying privately with a photographer. Um, I returned to Northern Vermont after that experience without a job, um, but Wonderfully enough, in about three or four or five months, a job came up at Shelburne Museum. They were looking for a staff photographer. I think it's probably about the only photographic job that came up in Vermont back in. Can you can so, you describe for our audience what Shelburne Museum is? You know, as you talk about it, because sure. it's a um, very sure. particular institution that I can see the influence. You know, Shelburne Museum um, is not like a traditional art museum, which is usually one large building or a group of small buildings. It's what it's called sort of a living museum uh, where they, there are many restored houses um, with period artifacts within them. Uh, and he also, in this, in this particular case of Shelburne Museum, which is located in, in just north uh, or nearby Burlington, Vermont on Lake Champlain, just across from the New York state, um, this this is a, a museum that was begun by Electra Habermeyer Webb, a New Yorker whose father was I think it was Henry Habermeyer, you know, very wealthy uh, person, nineteenth uh, into early twentieth century, and she was raised in in this sort of a, a an age and, and uh, experience of sort of opulence. Um, that they you know they were very large fortunes. They were you know connected with the Vanderbilts. And Pulitzers and, and a very extended family of, of very privileged and, and uh, 19th century wealth, um, but she she um, was raised in, in a home in, in uh, I think it was Park Avenue or Fifth Avenue in New York um, with her father's Mr. Habermeyer's collections of um, 19th century impressionists. He was a great collector of impressionism. I went literally to the studios of the artists in France and things and purchased directly or working with um, some of the renowned dealers in that period. Um, but she also had interests beyond the, the very high end uh, European collecting to uh, she took on the uh, more of an American experience of, of uh, uh, creativity. And that was sort of American folk art. She was one of the very early uh, collectors of American folk art, uh, which included everything from the cigar store. Uh, Indians' term was used then, uh, no longer in vogue, of course. But um, she was interested in early historic buildings, um, early American furniture, uh, textiles, quilts, coverlets, folk art paintings, and she just amassed collections. Um, which she eventually um, would send up literally in boxcars to Shelburne. The, the, the Webbs, um, she married a Webb, um, Electra Havemeyer, and, and would store it there. But then she, they, they brought in many, many buildings from uh, parts of Vermont, but also outside of the state of Vermont, very historic buildings, early um, 19th, late 18th century buildings. And created these as sort of a, as I call it, a living environment where one visitors can go into these different houses, and they would have sort of period uh, kinds of uh, material cultures, they might say, furnishings that relate to the period uh, when the house was built. They don't have; they're, they're sort of like a stir, uh, old Sturbridge village. The difference is they don't have the the guides that are dressed up in sort of period costumes and things, um, but. They, they very much um, have you know, very wonderful collections. So here I landed this job at Shelburne Museum as a staff photographer, admittedly with very little experience doing the, the kind of work that was demanded for the position. But the, John, but the, 
Yes. We're just, I'm just going to stop for a second. Okay. okay. Well, sorry for that, John, and a little interruption. I don't. So, can we get get back to what you were talking about? So I was I was talking about experiences at Shelby Museum. That landing the job there was um, quite daunting, but it was it was an, again a um, another important growth experience for about five years. I was there um, for. They had large format cameras, four by five cameras. Uh, or I had to make large format negatives and color uh, slides of um, many objects in their collections, most of which went into publishing. Um, and so the demand was very high. I, um, but also the staff who worked there, they were curators, different kinds of curators of different parts of the collection. They were visiting um, scholars who would come continually to the museum. They had summer institutes. Uh, and even as a young person in my 20s, I had to interact with these people um, and maybe make photographs of particular objects which they were publishing, maybe something in, in the magazine Antiques or books about certain folk art. And so I would bring paintings into the studio. And um, these people often would stand alongside me while I lit the, with the, you know, the photographic lighting, lit the objects and, and sort of wanted to ensure that they got a really good quality reproduction of particular artwork for the publication that was um, envisioned. And so that kind of immediate uh, jump in, in what would be considered uh, um, sort of not just creativity, but it was technical de demand on, on me to, to really practice uh, and, and learn much more about the medium of photography in order just to produce better quality for that day, day job I had. Um, and so that, and I ended up being, becoming friends with publishers who actually ended up publishing some of my work in their magazines. Um, my own my personal work, because I was always having much of my work produced at museum at the museum, published in you know, large mag magazines, and internationally. So that was that was a that was a, a real leap for, for me from northern Vermont, and, and a leap it was a very enjoyable leap from geology too. Yet, mm -hmm. um, as I was doing this museum work, I would return often to northern Vermont, which was about an hour and a half from Shelburne. And having seen all these objects, many of which looked so familiar to me, I'd seen them in farmhouses and at the museum, they were on display in, in you know, exhibit cases and things around the wall. I, I sort of felt it was interesting uh, that, that here was a museum sort of displaying the things as artifacts, whereas I could return an hour and a half to Northern Vermont and see them being used in a farmhouse. And I thought, though, that's, that's really important. So I sort of saw that northern northeastern vermont changing like maybe some of that culture is going to be going away maybe the those objects being utilized in situ or in place um uh, that whole tradition would be slowly disappearing or quickly disappearing and, and i think part of my rather you know young uh naive vision was probably a little bit too overactive in terms of understanding the fact that that would be eclipsing so quickly, but it certainly motivated me to begin a series, an extended series of photographs of uh, the Northeast Kingdom. As I, I remember one of my first applications for a Vermont Arts Council grant, I, that I wanted to go out and re record and document the, the people, the land and the architecture of Vermont's Northeast Kingdom. And then understandably it was a, it was a, <laughs> a large and, and uh, rather unfathomable size project and intended project. But it what's interesting though, that was, that was around 1972 that I think I put out that application um, after being at Shelburne for a number of months. And I was fortunately received the grant, uh, not an exceptionally large grant, but it was enough to really, it was sort of a nod that gave me some form of uh, belief that somebody did believe in what I was up to photographically. Mm -hmm. 
And I went right out and, and uh, began almost every weekend, I'd go to Northern Vermont and, and continue making photographs with large format cameras, four by five negatives and five by seven inch negatives. And, and you know, they're very cumbersome, these cameras, um, particularly when it's 20 below zero. And I'd be, you know, crawling across snow and pastures and making sort of abstract photographs of fences and, and pastures and then doing portraits of people in the summer and the winter and every other season imagined and, and kind of weather. But it, um, so it was a really, it's interesting dynamic between, you know, working during the week with these artifacts and then on, often on weekends or on vacations, um, living in this other environment, this rural place where I was, you know, raised um do documenting sort of the world and culture of of an environment only an hour and a half away from the more relative you know all those small urban areas of burlington um and so that that experience you know continued for about five years with many exhibitions of the work that traveled around the state of vermont um and then i cited it i became some I think it became a little bit repetitive and um, I decided I wanted to go on to graduate school. I had one close friend who'd written a review of some of my work in the mid 1970s in an exhibit at Middlebury College. And she suggested that um, I look at graduate school and take a workshop or go out and study in Rochester, which of course is a major center for photography. That's one of the greatest museums of photography in the world in, in Rochester, New York. It was the, also the home of the Eastman Kodak Company, was which home of Eastman produced. Kodak and and the, and the George Eastman House, the International Center of Photography. Right. And which, so, uh, for, the, for people who aren't in the field, the Eastman Kodak Company, or you know, are used to digital photography, <laughs> but Eastman Kodak was the source of you know of photographic materials, cameras. It, it was know, a major there source. There was just a whole com, you know rich community built around the photography there. And, and, and it's correct. And um, there were other people, other companies in, uh, not mainly in this country, but in England and in Germany, who were also making, and some Eastern Europe actually, making very wonderful papers and some films. But it was really Kodak was, was the epicenter. Uh, and, and Rochester in general was an interesting city because not only did they have, um, they had Eastman Kodak, they had Xerox Corporation, right? Had iTech Corporation. Uh -huh. They had Bosch and Loeb, and uh, there may have been a few others, but many of them all dealing with uh, vision machines, vision machinery. So here I am. The, um, and at this point, I of course uh, realized I was far more visual than I was verbal too. So there was no mm -hmm. reason to even consider why Johnny can't read. That was history. Now I, I I realized that my my forte was really in the in the visual studies areas. So I actually applied to this uh, small workshop, sort of a brain think tank uh, of undergrads and graduate students called the Visual Studies Workshop, and it was it was a, a quite a leap to again you know having made leaps leaving Vermont to go on to private school and then on to the universities and then on to Shelburne. And then here I was leaping off to Rochester, New York, a different area, different town, different state, uh, different environment. But um, it was a natural place for me to transition to because uh, the workshop attracted people, most of whom were very visual. I think uh, 80, 80 plus percent of the entire student body at the visual studies workshop were all left-handed of about a hundred students. Isn't that interesting? It yeah. is interesting. And then also, uh, this is just like an aside, but um, one of the graduate students was doing a research, did a research project about uh, left-handedness and also in some form of brain trauma as a, as during some part early one in one's life. And majority of the students there had suffered some form of uh, head trauma um, early on in their life. In my case, my mother told me, well, John, you did fall out of your crib on your head one time and was sort of lying there dazed on the floor. Uh, but other students had had, you know, horrific car accidents, bicycle accidents. But it was very interesting and in that she wondered if somehow that early 
stage trauma had influenced maybe the use of the left hand or or which or a more visual side of the brain. Um, so there was that kind of rather hedgy thinking there, um, but also there were these. The, the workshop had many very interesting photographers who were studying there, but also the faculty, uh, visiting researchers were all major players in the field of photography, photographic research, and photographic history. So, that, so I ended up moving there with my family, and we were there for three and a half years. I worked in the gallery. Um, um, produced many different bodies of work, did extensive research in the University of Rochester's uh, History of Medical Illustration uh, archive, and produced a book, a small press book about the history of medical illustration and, and how uh, the camera influenced medical perception uh, in the 19th and early and into the early uh, early 20th century. But, but, but it was that kind of environment which uh, I really induced that kind of interest for me anyway, and and it um, and I also found a, a wonderful support system there for uh, taking photography in any direction one wishes, wherever I wish to go, and um, it can probably develop a stronger set of colleagues for me, who with whom I still interact, um, because most of the people who, who I worked with there continue to produce uh, large bodies of work or, or are very involved as curators or even museum directors um, in, in the arts world. So it's, that was a, a pivotal experience with a whole institution filled with mentors, mm -hmm. as it were, right? Instead of the right. Um, so where would you like to go from here? Uh, you know, I um, we are going to do a part two of this interview because there's so much more to talk about. But, you know, I'm wondering if we could just talk right now a little bit about your discovery of your what you call your visual thinking and your visual memory that was a contrast to what you felt you were expected to do in school with auditory learning. But because I'm really curious about that, I'm not really sure what you mean when you talk about visual thinking. Um, it, it, well, I could talk about it on, on a, in a very naive, um, untrained way in that I, I think I was in a, um, I found that I it just enjoyed observing things at a young age. I mean, I would just go out by myself, sit out in the woods and just look at things, look at the river flowing by or, or um, I mean, I, I think being an only child, it's another thing too, is I think I had to find ways with which to entertain myself. Uh, I didn't always, was always able to sort of look to a sibling or um, and was, my parents would be somewhat helpful in that domain, but, but really I had to find ways to just in, find satisfaction just with my own sort of the world that I created. So I I um I think there are two things. I although I didn't really pursue it, I, I was very interested in music at a young age. I mean I think I growing up as a kid I always heard jazz playing. And when I went off to private school, a, a small group of us would always get together and we'd listen to jazz. We listened to John Coltrane and, and mm -hmm. all these great musicians when we were like 14 or 15 and everybody else was listening to the Beatles and things. We were fully involved with jazz, but what that has to do with vision, I don't know if it has to do with a particular part of the brain, um, but it was, it was very natural to me to not necessarily play music, but certainly to uh, it developed a great love of listening to music. Um, but the visual side of things is how did I learn that? I think that maybe in graduate school, I, I did a series of projects um, of my own work de dealing with perception and but also visual memory where I would do multiple images in space um, where I would make a certain composition and then I'd move to a different location and, and have to just remember the, the what was in the within the frame so I uh, would make a photograph that was from a different position but almost identical to the other one and then I'd present them as uh, diptychs that is that would be on a print would be two images um, and people would look at them and said, I don't see the difference. And then they begin, it was, a, I had done these for people 
to encourage them to look more carefully at photographs. Um, and because I think people, I just sort of had this feeling, I don't know, there might've been somewhat of a cynical feeling that people just sort of walked by imagery and they sort of look at them, oh, those are pretty, but they don't really stop and really ponder the nature of the image because never the photographer often spends an immense amount of time producing that image. Could be days and weeks, believe it or not. Um, and so I present these multiple images where you look at the things and, and um, I create some sort of energy within the image by producing or putting the two side by side. Uh, I mean, I literally chose the, the separation, the distance separation between the two images. So it's and people say, well, those are stereo views. I said, well, they're not at all stereo views. They're, and then they realized as they began to look at them and actually information was changing a little, but they looked identical. And so people mm -hmm. became more engaged with the images because they, they realized that one of my, what I was trying to teach them was to look very carefully. And remember, there was sort of a history of that kind of imagery. You remember the things where they, they, these complex, almost looked like a puzzle. They say, can you find the owl in the photograph or can you find the whatever in the image? All right. And, and uh, so I sort of played off those kind of fun little games. Um, but as I was doing that, I was also, I did a, a double sort of major in grad school. I did the, the project working with the history of medicine il illustrations um, and, and also reading uh, voraciously uh, early writing. I mean, Leonardo da Vinci's writing and notebooks were used in part to try All to right. st structure this book. Um, and and what was amazing it was like the same thing with Shelburne Museum and and, and my freelance work. Uh, as I think about the very good fortune I have had working with mentors, but also the amazing good luck that I've had handling extraordinary material. Like yeah. as my as a photographer, freelance my day job, freelance and working in in, in museums, I was able to handle just extraordinary objects. Um, I mean, when I was in my 20s, I was handling Rembrandt paintings. I mean, when you're picking up a Rembrandt right, in the Schauber Museum, right? as a photographer, you're, you're just yeah. looking at these paintings. Now, I didn't know Rembrandt's history. And, and so, and, John, we are going to need to stop because <laughs> we are limited by this radio show. I'm sorry. And so <laughs> I am we are going to we're going to uh, do a part two for next week because this is really just the beginning. And I really do want to continue to explore your, I am still, you know, not, I don't really, I have to think a lot about this thing about the visual thinking and visual memory. Um, because obviously it's been so fundamental to your work and the, um, the, the finesse of it. And that means the fine points, the things that as most people don't really see. Um, so at any rate, um, and I do want to also, we, we will continue to explore perspectives on community because I think that that has always been intertwined with your work as you've been talking about. So thank you very much, John. We'll be talking again next week. This is Mercy Russell with the Remarkable Relationship Show. My guest is John Miller, a documentary photographer from the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. And uh, we'll um, be back next week. Thank <music> you.